Good evening and thank you for joining us. The masks are off for many across Ontario. The province has listed, lifted its mask mandate for most indoor settings, including the classroom. However, many students and staff at local schools have decided to keep the face coverings. Reportedly about 50% of students were still masked today. Mitchell Ringos has the details. For nearly two years, COVID-19 has vastly changed the learning experience for students. Now that masking is no longer required in the classroom, there is excitement from many, but not all are ready to ditch their last line of defense against the virus. The president of the Lakehead Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, Mike Judge, says both staff and students continue to wear them this week, though the numbers vary from each school. He's heard of a range from three quarters still wearing their face coverings to less than 50% in other schools. The Lakehead District School Board had recently asked for an extension of the mask mandate with worry of high rates of gatherings and travel over the March break. The request was eventually denied. Judge says many have the same worry coming out of the week's long holiday and it's leading to more masking in the classroom, which he expects to start dropping in the coming weeks. With uh, families taking that opportunity to travel a little bit or, you know, there were some big hockey tournaments in the city, for example, this past weekend. And, and so some gatherings were you know, larger gatherings. And so I think some families are, are, are being a little bit cautious, which is probably appropriate and, and we'll make a, a, another decision come next Monday. Judge says it is a challenging time for families and staff, but a lot of younger students haven't got to react to their peers without masks on and aren't even aware what most of them look like. So this is a big step for all students. Students with special needs who need to see that those facial expressions as a such an important part of communication. I think that's been lost in this a little bit. And yes, of course, we had to defer to public health and safety, but it's also a big moment that people have been waiting for. And so... I'm excited for, for those folks. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News. Masks are still required in some locations, like hospitals, long-term care homes, and public transit. Colin DeMello breaks down the rules and the timeline to lift all restrictions. As the mandatory masking policies were lifted in Ontario, at Queen's Park, the new uneasy divide became apparent. The Ontario Progressive Conservatives largely unmasked. The Ontario NDP largely masked up. We have a number of immunocompromised uh, members in our, uh, in our caucus. We had the discussion and decided, you know, we're just going to wait a couple more weeks. But as masks come off, the question remains, is now the right time to push past pandemic measures? On social media today, Premier Doug Ford says the province is marking an important milestone and says Ontario is at a safe place where we can safely remove the mask mandate in most settings. But others in health care aren't so sure. Personally, I think masking should continue for just a little while longer and should be reassessed sometime in early or mid-April only because we've started to see some signals of rises in cases since the lifting of restrictions on March 1st. In fact, wastewater data, now an indicator of COVID-19 spread in Ontario, has slowly been trending upwards. Some regions are still dealing with outbreaks. Uh, Southern Ontario uh, is putting the pandemic behind them. But for those of us who live in the far north, the pandemic is not over. The government says, however, masks are now a choice, one that even the premier has promised to exercise. And for the next five months, they will continue to be mandatory on public transit, long-term care, retirement homes, and health care settings until April 27th. Other politicians say they are now waiting for more information before removing their masks. That's not going to be forever. No, no, it, it can't be forever, but you need to, everybody has to make their own assessment personally. Here at Queen's Park, those personal assessments seem to align with politics as well. Well, those COVID-19 cases on Northern Reserves account for a large percentage of all the cases across northwestern Ontario right now. As for the regional hospital, the number of COVID patients there went up over the weekend. COVID-19 cases at the Regional Health Sciences Centre have risen to 28 up from 21 on Friday and 25 over the weekend. Nine of those patients are in intensive care, three more than on Friday. Both the overall hospital occupancy rate and ICU occupancy sit at 100%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 101 new cases over the weekend. The number of active cases has fallen from 166 on Friday to 153. 
The Northwestern Health Unit continues to see a large caseload. There are 264 active infections there. The vast majority of those cases, 236, come from the Northern Reserves and the Sioux Lookout Health Hub. No other health hub has more than nine active cases. The NWHU's seven-day test positivity rate is now at 17.6 percent. CP rail workers across the country hit the picket line yesterday, including those here in Thunder Bay. National union representatives cite wages as a major sticking point in talks, while local employees say they want the company to change scheduling procedures. Lee Noonan has more on that. About a dozen of 80 local Canadian Pacific Railway workers remain on the picket line as the work stoppage entered its second day. John Strapic, Thunder Bay chair for the Teamsters Canada Rail Conference, says he understands that the timing is never good for rail strike, but that the workers need to fight for themselves. It's, it's been a fight every time we, we go through negotiations. We really hope that they'll sit down and they'll uh, bargain quickly. I mean, we want this over. None of us want to be here. We want to be working. Strapic says rail workers are fighting for increased pensions, fairer treatment in disciplinary actions, and changes to scheduling policies for workers who are on call 24-7, 365 days a year. He says the unpredictability of work schedules makes it difficult to rest before shifts, which is a safety concern, and takes a toll on family life, making it next to impossible to make or keep plans. Well, I got two kids at home, and um, I, very hard. I don't think I, I think I've made five of their birthdays in the last 13 years and uh, I mean yeah it, it, it's a great job uh, but sometimes it'd be nice to know well hey I, there's an opportunity for me to be at home for my for my kids for a hockey game. Most of our trips uh, going to Ignis and back we're away from home for 24 or 36 hours and the new rules that they're trying to put in will have us away 36 to 48 or more and then when home, we're only home for 24 or less hours. So they're causing us to be away from home more than home. <laughs> CP Rail declined an interview request, but in a statement released on Sunday called the strike reckless and accused the union of acting in bad faith. Each organization is accusing the other of initiating the work stoppage. Lee Noonan, CBT News. And we'll have more on the CP Rail stoppage later on in the news hour. The Bombardier Labour Action Centre has been given extended life after it was scheduled to close on Tuesday. The Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development is providing $170,000 to keep the centre open until October. The centre was initially established in 2019 to support more than 500 workers after significant layoffs at that time. The extension allows for continued support to 296 additional Alstom employees and their families who have recently been laid off or will get their notice by the end of next week. Bombardier Labour Adjustment Committee Chair Ian Angus says he's grateful that they can continue to run this important service at another tumultuous time for the local plant. We're very pleased that the ministry uh, and the minister have agreed to uh, support the continuation of the centre. Uh, we think it's only fair that uh, these new laid off workers get the same uh, access as their colleagues have. Angus says it's doubtful the centre will continue to operate past October. He expects the majority of laid off workers to be recalled as Alstom has secured a number of new contracts. For the first time since the start of the pandemic, tonight's City Council meeting is open to the public. Residents will be able to attend in person to watch councillors debate a number of topics, including the purchase of four new vehicles for Superior North EMS. If the vehicles are approved, it will cost $760,000 with additional costs for equipment required to outfit each ambulance. Council will also decide whether or not the city should join the Thunder Bay Living Wage Campaign while city employees are already paid above the local living wage, approval would be seen as a symbolic gesture to show support for the campaign. Thunder Bay is asking residents for input on how to improve Indigenous relations. The city has issued a survey asking people for their thoughts. 
The survey is meant to help outline priorities as part of the city's Indigenous relations strategy. Those include creating more Indigenous spaces, increasing awareness of Indigenous culture, and focusing on anti-racism education. The survey is available for Indigenous and non-Indigenous residents, as well as community partners and service providers. The city's Indigenous relations manager, Tanis Thompson, says it's important to gather a wide range of ideas and opinions. It takes a change of community, it takes a a community to heal a community and hearing from everyone and being unified and collectively working together to implement these commitments is our main priority and ensuring that the work that we're doing is meaningful and impactful based off the feedback that we receive from everyone. The survey is available on the city website. Hard copies are also available at City Hall, branches of Thunder Bay Public Library, and Ashnabi Muskiki. Confederation College recently hosted a virtual talk about supporting mental health during the pandemic. The keynote speaker was a well-known Canadian TV personality. Michael Landsberg is a longtime TSN broadcaster, an author, and the founder of Sick Not Weak. The talk took place on Facebook Live. Landsberg discussed helping those who are struggling with their mental health, either because of the pandemic or other world events. Landsberg notes students have been through a lot in recent years. He offered words of encouragement and tips on maintaining or restoring good mental health. He also stressed the importance of knowing the difference between depression and general sadness. When you wake up and you go, it doesn't matter what I do today. It doesn't matter who I see. It doesn't matter what great things happen to me. I won't be able to feel the joy. That's depression. When you lose someone that you care about, that's sadness and inevitability in all of our lives. You can't go your life without feeling sad. And being sad is a normal state of emotion. Sadness when it's appropriate. But depression is an illness. Landsberg's presentation is available to watch on the Confederation College or Suki Facebook pages. Area curling clubs are getting a financial boost thanks to the recent Scotty's Tournament of Hearts held at Fort William Gardens. $60,000 is being split between the Fort William, Port Arthur and Kekabeka curling clubs. And while that total is down from what it could have been if fans had been allowed to attend, it was still a reason to celebrate over the weekend. Mitchell Ringles has more. The 2022 Canadian Women's Curling Championship was a success despite the fact that the end result could have been so much more for the city of Thunder Bay, the local curling community, Team Krista McCarville and Curling Canada. But with the whole city making the most out of the event, the Fort William Curling Club, Port Arthur Curling Club and Kekabeka Falls Curling Club wanted to extend a sincere thank you to everyone who made the event possible in the first place along with the resulting profit of over $60,000 to be split amongst the three local curling clubs that will further develop the sport of curling in our community. You know, it was disappointing when we couldn't have the crowd, we couldn't have all the fundraising things that we usually do at the Scotties, but, you know, just to have that little bit and to, like, look at those clubs in Thunder Bay and just say thank you to them and... You know, everything that Thunder Bay has done, I think it's really special. I mean, we were so fortunate with the way that our fans were supportive of the event, even though they weren't able to make it. They weren't able to participate and actually come to the event, but they supported, as I mentioned, our 50-50, and they obviously followed it. PSM was really happy with the viewership, so they followed it for sure. And going forward, Curling Canada has advised the local committee that they hope Thunder Bay will consider inviting them back to put on a full-fledged Scotties in the not-too-distant future. If the local curling community decides to pursue that invitation, Thunder Bay can look forward to having the stands full of cheering fans, the Scotties patch alive with local entertainment, and another chance to show the rest of the world that Thunder Bay truly is the center of Curling Canada, which Tourism Thunder Bay Development Officer John Cameron is hoping for. Obviously, if we host this event again, instead of uh, two local hotels being full to capacity, we will have 15 to 20 hotels full to capacity with uh, the 5,000 uh, spectators that would come from out of town to cheer on their various province, territory or team that is here. Mitchell Ringo's TVT News. Well, Fiona, after a beautiful weekend we had, I